This first image, I'm sure is familiar to most of you. Um, it's a painting, I'm not sure it really qualifies as a work of art, but it's a painting <laughs> that could have been painted only now during Trump's presidency. It's the Republican Club, a group portrait of selected Republican presidents. It's by Andy Thomas <clears throat> hangs now in the White House, appeared behind Trump during a recent TV interview. Um, the gazes of the figures in this image are not very well managed, but I think we're intended to see Trump as looking across the table at Abe Lincoln. Everybody remembers what Trump said about John McCain, that he prefers war heroes um, that don't get captured. Perhaps he's saying to Lincoln, he prefers presidents that don't get assassinated. <laughs> Artists and poets sometimes present themselves as, as prophets. Both an artist and a poet, William Blake, had a vision of England redeemed from everything dark and demonic. In the verse that pr precedes Milton, a poem, which is one of his sprawling prophetic epics, this vision of Blake's becomes uh, vivid in a verse that begins. It evokes a legend, it's a pretty obscure legend, but one that Blake knew. Uh, that at one point Jesus uh, visited England. And so in his poem he asks, Did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among, the <clears throat> among these dark satanic mills? After calling for his bow of gold in his chariot of fire. Blake ends with one of the most stirring stanzas in English poetry. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Despite all that we might wish, mental fight and all the imaginative power of all the artists and poets and composers and playwrights of the modern period, despite their imaginative powers, the New Jerusalem has not been built in England or anywhere else, yet the prophetic impulse persists. The utopian modernists who emerged after the First World War, the artists and architects of De Stael and the Bauhaus, among the Russian constructivists, prophesied that their formal innovations would carry over to ordinary life. And this would remake society along lines laid down by their principles of coherence and harmony. We call the paintings of Piet Mondrian's De Style period abstract, and yet he didn't want us, or his audience then, to see these works as detached or self-referential exercises in pictorial form and equilibri an equilibriated composition, that's his phrase, uh, that he coined in 1919, refers to social structure because quote, art and life are one, end quote. A painting's formal harmony prophesies social harmony because, quote, equilibriated relationships in society signify what is just, end quote. According to Mondrian's utopian logic, the proliferation of his kind of art would institute peace and justice throughout Europe 
and the world. Other utopian modernists made similar prophecies. None of them was fulfilled. Art is not prophetic. However, the art world, or a certain sector of the art market, has displayed a certain prophetic power. In 1987, a buyer paid $85 million for this Vincent van Gogh vase with, 50, uh, with 15 sunflowers from 1888. It marks a... It's blank. It's blank. <laughs> That's what you... <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, there's something symbolic about that in relation to the high-end art market, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, this was a signal event. It, it, it tripled any, the, the previous record at auction. And it set off a cluster of record prices in the 1990s. A few more were set during the following decade and a half, and then another larger cluster of records was achieved in 2006 through 2008. Uh, there was an accelerating pace, and the pace kept accelerating. Over half of the 100 most expensive paintings on record were sold in the past seven years. This is a surge in extravagance that, was, that culminated last November with the sale of Leonardo Salvador Mundi for a bit over $450 million. I'm not going to show a slide of that. It's not a very good painting, not a very good Leonardo, if indeed it is a Leonardo. However, most of the paintings on the top 100 list are of high quality. Major works by Cezanne, Picasso, Pollock, Titian, Rembrandt, and <laughs> this great uh, Pontormo painting, Jacobo Pontormo portrait of a Halberdier Halber Halber from 1537. It went for nearly $70 million in, in 1987. That's a price that puts it right near the middle of the top 100 record prices. Pontormo and Picasso and the others I mentioned are old masters and old modernist masters. Quality falls off precipitously when we turn to contemporary works that have been knocked down at auction for record amounts. This Van Gogh, La Lady's Alice Camp, also 1888, was sold in 2015 at Sotheby's for just over $68 million. Two years earlier, Christie sold the Bloon Dog Orange by Jeff Koons for $63 million. Now, would anyone, even the purchaser of the Bloon Dog, argue that these roughly comparable prices are evidence of roughly comparable aesthetic quality. The argument would be that as art, the Coons is as good as the Van Gogh. Maybe somebody would say that, but I don't think anyone would ever say it in good faith, not even the person who bought the balloon dog. Could be wrong about that, but. Prices like these make sense only if they're paid for paintings and sculptures valued not as works of art, so that the aesthetic judgment or comparison is irrelevant in this game. These prices are paid for paintings and sculptures valued not as works of art, but as something else. And the question is, what? How can a buyer see La Ley des Alice Camp as anything but a work of art? Well, my answer to that is that as our economy tilts further and further toward oligarchy, flagrant and grandiose oligarchy, this becomes an easy question. 
When you pay a record price for a Van Gogh, it becomes a prize, a trophy in a highly competitive game of ostentatious display. You show that when it comes to showing off, money is no object. You have more than enough. This is why I put the blanks in. I don't want that to be on the screen uh, any more than it has to be. I'm not saying that all the buyers of overpriced Van Goghs and Titians and Cezannes are, are entirely indifferent to the high quality and the art historical significance of their purchases. After all, it's the quality and significance of these paintings that makes them suitable trophies in, high, in the high stakes competition for prestigious works of art. So it may be that some who pay outrageous prices for old master and old modernist master paintings and sculptures are able to cherish them not only as trophies, but also as works of art. This cannot be said of those who chase after overpriced works of contemporary art. That is because the trophies in this variation of the game, works by Jeff Koons, Damien Hirst, Christopher Wool, and a few others, are not works of art. They can, be tri they can be prized only as trophies. How can I say this? Kuhns presents himself as an artist, the, and the others do too, the ones I just named. Kuhns' balloon dogs are shown in art galleries. They're reviewed by art critics. They're offered at auction and sales of contemporary art. You might say to me, well, you don't like the balloon dogs. You think they're bad works of art, but surely that doesn't qualify them, that doesn't disqualify them for the work of art label. And that's true. My dislike of the balloon dogs is not what disqualifies them. What disqualifies them, or to put it the other way around, what makes them works of non-art is their emptiness, and their paucity of meaning. A work of art, properly so-called, is inexhaustibly meaningful, significant, evocative. There is no end to interpreting a work of art. And that is why critics never agree. That is why each generation finds its own range of meanings in works of art, in the plays of Shakespeare, in the poems of Wallace Stevens, in the paintings of Cezanne and Barnett Newman. To qualify as a work of art, to qualify as art, a work must be endlessly and fruitfully ambiguous. It is a balloon dog fails to qualify as art because it is not in the least bit ambiguous. It is an immediately recognizable emblem of its maker's unwarranted claim to be a great artist. That's all there is to it. And that narrowness, that shallowness of meaning is effective for it makes a balloon dog an extremely efficient and in its way perhaps even likable. I mean, they're kind of cute. Uh, but that aside, I mean, many things in souvenir shops are sort of cute. you know. And Coons, of course, has blown up items from souvenir shops and shown them as works of art. But that narrowness, that shallowness of meaning is effective for it makes a balloon dog an extremely efficient emblem or logo of Jeff Coons. Trouble is that a logo is not a work of art. It is the product of a design process. None of this is in the least bit troubling to those who chase after balloon dogs and pay absurd prices for them. Because as it serves as a logo of Kuhn's grandiosity, the balloon dog also serves as the logo of the buyer's affluence. In the performance of these functions, the balloon dog asks to be recognized, not contemplated. There's much to say about the social, cultural, and economic factors that turned 
this object into the emblem that it is, but there's nothing to say about the emblem in and of itself once you have read its simple and tightly circumscribed meaning. There's nothing more to interpret, to understand, nothing more to say. You've, you've exhausted the subject. The crucial comparison is to the exhaust, inexhaustibility of, say, a scene from mythology as painted by Titian. Whoops. Where am I? Oh, getting ahead of myself. This is Titian's Diana and Acteon. It's from the late 1550s. It retells a myth that Titian or the people he went to for subject matter uh, probably found in Ovid. It's a complex story um, and one that's been retold many times. It's been the subject of tragic plays in ancient Greece, by poetry down through the years, the millennia. But I'm not, what I want you to see here is, is I'm, I'm not a formalist, or I'm not only a formalist, but the thing that's at stake here, or that I've put at stake in my, in my argument, is the formal complexity of it. Not divorced from the subject matter, whether we're familiar with the story of Diana and Actian or not, there's certainly subject matter to be seen, but it's just the formal richness of it that is the point here. It was sold in 2000, and I, I put this particular Titian on because it's one of two Titians that's on the top 100 list. This one was sold in 2009 for just over $80 million. Now, by contrast, I'm arguing that an image like this is inexhaustible, whether you look at it, however you look at it, and there are infinite ways of looking at it. By contrast, the meaning of the images and objects that fall under the headings of logo, decoration, illustration, and graphics are exhaustible because they're intended to achieve a strictly delimited purpose grasp the purpose, get the message, or in the case of a decorative image, get the effect, and that's the end of it. Again, one can talk endlessly about the socio-cultural economic origins and applications of such objects and images, but when we focus on the images and the objects themselves, we find nothing to do or say but to acknowledge their narrow purpose and to judge how well they achieved that purpose. I mean, there are good logos and bad logos. There are decorative schemes that are attractive and, and ones that one finds unattractive. I'm arguing that those purposes, the purpose of a logo, the purpose of a decorative scheme, is narrow, circumscribed. Um, not a bad thing in itself, but that's not what a work of art is. Ordinarily, there's nothing wrong with any of these forms of non-art. I'm not a great fan of logos, but I love illustrations, especially the ones I remember from certain children's books. There's decorative imagery I like, the floral patterns on 18th century Venetian furniture, for example. I like graphics and typography in the art deco mode. But graphic design, in whatever style, is exhaustible and therefore not art. Here's an example. This is Apocalypse Now, 1987, by Christopher Wool. It's claimed to be, well, what a sliver of a claim it has to be a work of art rests on something pretty narrow. It's paint on canvas. That's about it from my point of view. I think it's a very weak claim. What it can legitimately, what it can legitimately claim is some graphic punch in the service of an anxious joke. 
I mean, I guess you might do this if you felt that it really was, the apocalypse really was imminent. I'm not sure you could find a market, but anyway, uh, it's, it's a kind of a joke. It's not, it doesn't really have a punchline, or it isn't really a punchline, but it it's, conveys an attitude anyway. Um, and whatever it conveys is conveyed with a lot of graphic punch, as I said. But once you get the mood, get the message, that's it. There's nothing more to it. You've exhausted the meaning of the work. Further work, further looking, really gets you nothing. <laughs> oh, God. Um, here's a decorative work by Damien Hirst. It's called Gligli Alla. It's a, wood, a woodcut from 2016. Now, Hearst makes images like these in many sizes and mediums. Some are priced to be affordable. Some of them are very expensive. A few years back, his gallery showed 300 polka dot paintings spread over a number of galleries. They were all rendered in paint on canvas. 100 of, of these 300 polka dot paintings were for sale at prices ranging from a million to a million and a half. Um, as I see it, and as I see the Christopher Wool painting, this really doesn't reward extended contemplation. You can pretty much get it in a glance. And so works of this kind I see as non-art Pleasant enough, if that's what you like, but nothing more than that. <laughs> I, this is my example of an illustration, one that's been in the news recently. Um, like graphics and illustration and, and decoration, illustration is exhaustible. I was thinking, in it, to go back to it just an earlier, among my favorite children's book illustrations are paintings by Arthur Rackham that I remember as accompanying uh, The Wind in the Willows. And these are wonderful illustrations. They were painted, they were paintings, and they're very complex. I was saying to anybody, can I really say that this falls under the heading of non-art? And I decided that yes, it does fall under the heading of non-art for all its complexity and for all the wonderful detail and, and uh, the brilliant characterizations, not only of the creatures in Wind and the Willows, but of the, of, the, of the milieu, the scene, the wonderful riverside scenes and in the, in the dark forest and all that. Because it's intended, once again, for a circumscribed purpose. Now maybe, or definitely, Arthur Rackham's purpose is more complex than Banksy's here, but they're similar in that they are circumscribed. I would say that if you look from the Arthur Rackham, I wish I, well, it would probably be too complicated if I'd brought in a, a, a slide of an Arthur Rackham, go off on a tangent way too far. But if you compare a really rich, richly developed illustration from one of your favorite children's books to the Banksy, um, you know, you, you may prefer that illustration, but it's still in the same category of an image designed and calculated with great, in both cases, I think, with great professional skill <clears throat> to achieve a definable purpose. And you can exhaust the Arthur Rackham image, no matter how complex it, it, it is, in fact. Or think of those drawings that accompany Stuart Little. I mean, the, uh, Gar I think the uh, illustrator's name is Garth Williams. It's wonderful uh, drawings, but ultimately, they don't rise to the level of works of art. Uh, they're, they're, and very deliberately, and, and I would say brilliantly, focused on the task of accompanying a text and illustrating it. They are circumscribed. However much affection, and I have great affection for those images, however much affection they have. 
They're not endlessly ambiguous. Uh, they probably they wouldn't work as illustrations if they were. Now, to get back to Banksy, this is a girl with a balloon, the one that tried to shred itself recently just after it went for nearly $2 million at Sotheby's. There's not much to say about this illustration. <laughs> Distinguished as it is by sentimentality and undistinguished drawing. So what you get when you buy a Banksy is a sort of proximity to a high profile art world, world satirist. He's a celebrity. And this is a kind of a celebrity souvenir. Uh, and for someone who wants this sort of thing, all the more precious because that's a lot of money to pay for a souvenir. But it's not the same as buying a work of art. Turning again to Kunz's balloon dog, the one that bought, bought uh, that brought $58 million at auction, I can only repeat that as a logo, it is very effective. More so, as I see it, than many corporate logos. All right, you might say, but what's exactly the problem with that? The problem is that the Kuhn's logos and other works of non-art put depletion in place of plenitude, narrow and shallow meaning in place of full, inexhaustible meaning. These works of non-art usurp the place of art. Because they've gotten scads of attention for doing this, they have reduced much of the art world conversation to platitude and sensationalism. And so there are all these headlines about immense prices, all, these re all this reporting about the busy beavers in uh, Kunz's studio. And think of the reasons for Kunz's inflated prices. A balloon dog is sought after and overpaid for because it conveys so efficiently a brash and simple message. I am expensive. Furthermore, I am perfectly willing to serve as a sign of a collector's wealth, as the embodiment of a vulgar boast. Now, I've put this uh, Mondrian on the on the screen. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. It's co the composition of in red, ye blue, and yellow from 1937-42. This is kind of an antidote. I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, for all its uh, spareness, I would argue that it's as rich formally and in other ways as that obviously complex painting of, of Titian's. To go on from this notion that a balloon dog is the embodiment of a vulgar boast. The producers of high-end contemporary art, or rather non-art, have for some years now collaborated in the project of filling the art world with vulgarity, distracting all too many with an aesthetic of ostentation they've offered brazenness as a kind of virtue. Thus they resemble Trump. And because, as I said earlier, the overinflated art market began to develop long before Trump became president, we can see this segment of the art market is prophetic. Poetry is not prophetic, nor is art. But the ultra-high-end art market, which has placed vulgar trophy hunting at the center of the art world, prophesied a president who has put vulgarity at the center of our society and our politics. When I got to this point, I asked myself, what more is there to say? Um, I was stymied until I remembered another poem about the millennium, another one besides Blake, which looks forward to the time when England becomes the promised land. I remembered The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats which announces that a, a dire millennium is upon us, or it was upon the world in 1919 when he wrote the poem. Its first stanza is well known. 
Now, some of you may have heard recordings of Yeats reading his poems. He has this wonderful, well, first of all, he has a wonderful Irish accent, but he has this sort of fluty, almost operatic sort of seance voice, as if he's conveying spirits through, through his poetry and through his voice to, to, to the audience. I, I'm not even, not even tempted to try that, but uh, you can imagine that as I read this first stanza of the, of the second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Because this is a poem, a work of literary art, its meanings are ex inexhaustible. Moreover, their meanings are indecidable. No interpretation can claim to be the right one, right once for all and for all times. And that gives me latitude to make what I will of Yeats's language and imagery. I'd like for this occasion to zero in on the notion of the center and the implied faith that in ordinary times, the center holds. It is stable and coherent, but now, in unsettled and unsettling times, the center cannot hold. Imagine that the center is society, held together by a, cl a cluster of compatible and interconnected standards and virtues. The virtues include, but are not limited to, kindness, generosity, open-mindedness and curiosity, courage, and the capacity for fairness and forgiveness that encourages social harmony. Includes, but, not, but is not limited to, is the sort of language we might find in a contract. And that phrase came to mind because one of the crucial fictions of early modern political Theory was the social contract. I call it a fiction because no society rests on a contract explicitly accepted by all its members, and yet Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Jean Rousseau and other social contract theorists were onto something because a, so a society does not cohere. Its center does not hold unless most of its members agree, for the most part implicitly, that a certain set of virtues should be cultivated. And certain standards must be maintained. In our society, these include standards of justice and decency and rationality. The center cannot hold if we are not rational enough to distinguish between the true and the false. Nor can the center hold if there is no authority that the majority is willing to accept? Authority resides partially in institutions, the institutions of government, state, federal, local. The institutions of academia and science, of the press and all its variety and varying degrees of seriousness. The, th the authority of custom and tradition doesn't always take institutional form, yet it's powerful nonetheless. Though we hope for the best from authority, these hopes are not always met. Authority is sometimes deployed cruelly to marginalize minorities, for example, ethnic minorities, gender minorities, religious minorities, Running counter to our ideals of fairness and decency, our standard of equal justice, marginalization of this kind is absolutely unjustified. Most people would agree with that. But there are other kinds of marginalization. When society's center holds, it is in part because criminal activity has been marginalized kept under some degree of control.
this, the exercise of this control, this marginalization is also justified when it is turned against hate groups. Now, hate groups often behave criminally. Yet there's a distinction to be drawn between their members and the members of criminal groups. The latter are driven chiefly by hope of gain, mostly monetary. Hate groups are driven by bigoted ideologies. And we find a different driver when we look at cults, justifiably marginalized groups of yet another kind. A cult is driven and sustained by its members' faith in a delusional fantasy. These fantasies can be apocalyptic. They can be nostalgic. The hardcore members of the Trump cult are united in a delusional faith that he is going to return America to a lost state of imaginary perfection. He is going to make America great again. Having gathered a sizable minority into its ranks, the Trump cult is now a significant presence, not on the margin, but in the social center. Some members of the Trump cult also belong to hate groups, which Trump and influential Trumpians have encouraged to leave the margins of society and take up positions in the center. Writers at the New Yorker, the New York Times, and elsewhere have characterized the Trump Organization as, quote, a criminal enterprise, end quote. By residing in the White House, Trump has brought criminality as far from society's margins as one can imagine. The center, many of us fear, is not holding, though it's misleading to talk of the center. There are many centers. Now I'm going to take a bit of a turn. There are many centers, among them the one occupied by art. Not by the art world, but by art itself. Of course, there are many ways to think of art. At present, I'm thinking of it as a tradition. And there are, I know, throughout the world, many art traditions. I want to focus on ours, the tradition of Western art, which reaches from this moment, this very moment, back to ancient Greece or, or back to archaic Greece. During two and a half millennia, through extraordinary shifts in theme and style in media, shifts in patronage and purpose, the center of this art tradition has held. Stabilized and rendered coherent by its persistent, by its traditional values and standards. These include visuals flow or grace, which the Greeks, the Greeks called rhythmos. Their eurythmia is what we call formal harmony and overlaps with their symmetria, the commensurability of part to part. These ideals came together in the Italian Renaissance under the idea of composition, which the painter and architect Leon Battisti Alberti described in 1435 as, quote, that rule of painting by which the parts of things are seen to fit together, end quote, adding that the grace, quote, we call beauty, is born from composition. So we see that art and society both include harmony on their list of virtues. That may be why Mondrian, with his visionary inclinations and his deep knowledge of the tradition of Western art, came to believe that there's a necessary connection between the forms of society and the formal structures of paintings, sculptures, and architecture, buildings. Whatever connection there be, may be, it's not necessary in any strong sense of the word. That is, the art's fit with society is not logically necessary, nor is it necessary in the light of some transcendent truth. There is, though, a rough equivalence between social values and art values. From this equivalence follows an analogy between society's pattern of center and margins and art's pattern of center, to center and margins. 
The analogy isn't perfect. What society justifiably marginalizes is bad. Crime, hatred, toxic delusion. By contrast, the non-art marginalized by the art tradition is not in itself destructive. It's not bad. Graphic design, for example, can be good, but only by its own standards. Its standards are not those of art. And that is why art marginalizes graphic design, along with illustration, the decorative, and the entire range of emblems and logos. We've already met the principle that guides this marginalization. If the meanings of an image or an object are strictly delimited by a definable purpose, it's not a work of art. It has no place in the center of the tradition sustained, made coherent by visual qualities of the kind that it generate the inexhaustible meanings of art. Zooming out, we see that the two centers I've very sketchily mapped are holding, or at least we fear, that they're holding only tenuously. Both centers these days are agitated by a sense of instability, by fears of disintegration. For both have been vigorously infiltrated by all that they justifiably try to marginalize. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with, say, decoration or any form of non-art, yet their incursion into the center of art is driven by vulgar ambition, brazen ostentation, of a kind that is also seen at the center of our society in the age of Trump. The art world and the larger society are being distracted, even demeaned, by spectacles of vulgarity and boorish pretension, and by the indifference to the larger good that self-absorbed pretension always displays. But vulgarity is not the worst of it. The worst of it results from the simplification, from the crude devolution that our values and standards suffer when, the vulgar, when vulgar spectacle distracts the center from its true interests. For these are spectacles of brutal competition, toxic power. They have their debased meaning at the expense of better meaning at the expense of the subtlety and the nuance and the admirable grandeur that we find in art and in society at their best. So that is the worst of art and life in the age of Trump, the destruction of meaning. For if the capacity for meaning in all its complexity is not sustained, if it is not grounded in history and endlessly renewed, we will not be able even to begin to realize the best potential of our society and our tradition of art. Now this is a pretty grim picture that I've painted, or perhaps I should say illustrated. <laughs> so I'd like to end on a slightly different note by arguing that this grim picture is not the whole picture. The second stanza of, the second, of Yeats's second coming begins with this line, surely some revelation is at hand. Well, if so, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> all I know is that despite all the unwelcome incursions, I would say destructive incursions, into the realm of art, Genuine artists of every generation continue to make valuable work in all mediums, modes, and styles. Some of these artists are in this audience. Others are elsewhere. There are genuine artists throughout the city, up and down the Hudson Valley, where I live, and throughout the state, throughout the nation, in the world. Art persists and thrives supplying the meaning-laden confrontations and exchanges, the interactions at once aesthetic, social, and cultural that will, despite our present situation, ensure that the center does indeed hold.
Thank you.